Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Welcome to the second session of The Difference That Jesus Makes. Yesterday, we looked at the difference Jesus wonderfully makes to our view of God. Today, we're going to see the difference Jesus makes to how we view ourselves. Particularly, we're going to look at the difference Jesus makes to your self-esteem. And what a difference. Let me pray, and we'll start. My Father, I pray that this time together now would be, well, like that time when Peter was in prison and the angel came and just walked him through, past the guards, out of prison to freedom. I pray that this time now might be a time like that for many, that we might be liberated by the knowledge of Jesus, joyfully liberated by knowing him and all he is for us. And we pray in his great name, my Father. Amen. Okay, so self-esteem. Self-esteem. Now, let's be honest. This is probably about the commonest felt problem today, Nespa. I don't know why it felt like a Nespa moment. I don't know why. But isn't it, isn't it such a common felt problem today? Now, traditionally, that's not the case, of course. Traditionally, it used to be seen, the problem is people have too high a view of themselves. Now it's right the other way around. Uh, so many of our problems are seen to derive from the fact that we have a low, too low a view of ourselves, a low self-esteem. Now, why is our self-esteem such a problem for us? Why? Because it is, and I think we all, in different ways, do find that struggle. Why is it such a problem for us? Well, very simply, I think it's because, inevitably, we build our self-esteem on our performance, on how we do. So... We build our image of ourselves, our self-esteem, on what we've got, on what we do, on how we perform, basically on what we bring to the table. So if you feel that you look bad or you've done badly, then you feel bad about yourself, right? But if you feel you've done well, you're looking good, you've performed well, you feel good about yourself. And so you look at me and you think, well, that guy must feel good about himself because, you know. And, <laughs> oh, come on. A, a gentle titter would have been kinder. But, of course, the thing is, it doesn't work because even though, yeah, I know, I've got it, I've got other issues, actually. And so the reality is, that for as long as I build my identity on what I'm bringing to the table, my looks, my performance, my abilities, I'm going to feel depressed. Because the reality is I'm never doing well enough to satisfy my ego. And so my self-esteem, I find, is never satisfied. I'm always... Even when I peak in my performance, I'm looking for the next hill to climb. And only when I feel, when I've done that, then I'll be satisfied. So I've got this, this bottomless pit of need. that I always need more to satisfy and fulfill me. Now, of course, temporarily, you can feel good about yourself, right? If, if you've just done well, if you've just triumphed in something, or, you know, if you're just in the glow of youth. And you feel your own beauty, your strength, your abilities. You know, then you can feel good about yourself. But, you know, that will fade. <laughs> the beauty does fade. Uh, the abilities do decrease because we're in a world 
of entropy and decay. And so, our self-esteem is fragile. Very fragile. It's very fickle. It's cruel in how fickle it is. And it's enslaving. And so, once again... In Jesus, we see the most happy alternative, a great difference. And quite simply, what I want to do is this. I want us to have a very quick peek at Jesus' death and resurrection. And what I want to do is I want to push our self-esteem through Good Friday to Easter. Yeah? I want to push self-esteem through there through Good Friday, through the cross, and on to Easter. And then we'll see what happens to it. All right? You see, the thing is, here's why I want to do that. The thing is, everything in all of reality will one day go through death to resurrection. Everything. Because one day, Jesus will return. And at his great command... The entire universe will be consumed in the fire of his judgment and renewed. And every person, every speck of reality will be pushed through death to resurrection. Now, as I say that, I just want to clear up a potential misunderstanding there. I am not saying that on resurrection morning, everyone is going to wake up a Christian I'm not saying that. I'm saying things like Acts 24, 15. Paul says, I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Or if you want to see how Jesus puts puts it, come with me to John 5. John 5, let's flick to it. John 5, and we'll go from verse 28. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are are in the tombs will hear his, he's saying, my voice, the voice of the Son of Man, will hear my voice, and they will all come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. See, there is a resurrection to judgment. But all things must go through death to resurrection. For after all, all things hold together in Christ, Paul says in Colossians 1. All things hold together in him, and therefore what happens to him must affect all. And he is our forerunner. He is the head of the new creation. And so as he goes through death to resurrection, so all things must go. Does that make sense? All things one day must pass through death to resurrection, must pass through that judgment. And so if we want to see things Christianly, If we want to see things in the perspective of ultimate reality, if we want to be Christ-centered in our thinking, then we must, in fact, push all our thoughts, all our perceptions of reality through the mighty funnel of his death and resurrection. And you know what? Everything changes when you do that. Push your perspectives through death to resurrection. Everything changes beautifully. Caterpillars become butterflies. And I want to do that now with self-esteem. What happens when we push self-esteem through death to resurrection? Now, obviously, we need to start with the cross. So let's start with the cross. We're going to go from the cross to resurrection. And we'll start by seeing what the cross does to (laughs) self-esteem. Are you ready? 
the um, great... Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to do this. I promised I would do this. <laughs> Anytime I mention Martin Luther, I promised I would wear this specially <laughs> tailor-made Luther hat. Um, I, I don't get through many talks without mentioning him, and Pete knew that. Where, where are you, Pete? Hey, thank you, Pete. Pete knew I can't get through, so he had this Luther hat made. I think he's wearing it around the place. So there's a spot Luther competition on site going on. Luther, what was my point? Luther said, the great reformer Martin Luther said, the cross tests all. The cross tests all. Oh, yes, it does. What a test is the cross. Now, what do we see on the cross? On the cross, we get to see God's esteem of sinful humanity. On the cross, we see God's judgment of sinful humanity. Now, what sort of judgment is it? This judgment of God on sinful humanity. In God's judgment, it is not, it is not a little slap on the wrist and encouragement, now go and do better, is it? It's just nothing like that at all. Now, that is what we try to do in our lives. We see our failures and we think, upsy daisy. I'm just not quite as good as I could be. I'm going to try to do a little better. But the Lord is so much kinder, so much more realistic than we are. For the cross doesn't say, upsy daisy, you've come a little bit short, but you can try harder. That would be so cruel if God said that. For the trouble is, we can't do better. As hard as we try, we are weak and stumbling failures. That's who we are because of the fall. And so what God does so mercifully is instead of giving us a slap on the wrist and encouragement to do better... He puts sinful humanity to death on the cross. Failing, weak, sinful humanity is killed. And so the cross announces that, in fact, even our very lowest views of ourselves are not low enough. This is going to be great news, by the way. It doesn't sound it yet, does it? We have to go through the death. We have to. The cross is saying, even our lowest views are not actually low enough because the reality is we are such congenital failures, we must die. Now, of course, <laughs> everything in us bristles at what I'm saying, doesn't it? Right? Everything in us just rebels against that. And we refuse naturally, and we do this every day. We refuse to admit we're that bad. We refuse to admit we're that helpless. We think we can do a little bit better. We refuse to admit that we've got that deep a problem. We refuse to submit to the just judgment of the most wise and gracious God. And we try to cling on to our lives, clinging on to our identities, thinking, I can do better. I, I, I can be all that I dream to be. I can, I can do it if I just try a bit harder. And the cross kindly says, no, you can't. You can't do it. It's in fact, it is cruel to beat yourself up and imagine that you can. You cannot do it. And to try to cling on to this identity of yours, imagining that you can do better, is just clinging on to an identity that will never be good enough. 
It's clinging on to an identity that will always be disappointing you, that will lift you up in pride one day and slam you down into depression at your failures the next. That's why our self-esteem is so fickle. And the cross says, no, come and die. Come and die. Now, we bristle at that. Of course we don't want to go there. But because it is the doorway to resurrection, to new life, Paul, for example, keeps coming back to it as the liberating secret to Christian freedom and joy. Come with me to Galatians 6. Galatians 6, right at the end of this remarkable letter. And Paul starts getting so excited, he can't even have the scribe write for him anymore. And so what he does, he's now going to say something that's so personally important to him. He grabs the pen off his scribe and he says, verse 11, Galatians 6, 11, see what large hands I'm writing to you. Large letters, large hands, large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. You see, see, look, now I'm writing. I've got to write this stuff now. What is it? What do you want to say, Paul? Let's dive into verse 14. Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which... The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but a new creation. When we talk about becoming a Christian, I think very often, and there's some truth to this, we tend to talk about inviting Christ into our lives. And there's something true to that. The bigger truth, in fact, is when someone becomes a Christian, they're taken into Christ's life. It's more than he comes into my life, because that can seem like, oh, that's nice. I've got a little bit of something extra in my life now. It's, it's, no, no, no. It is, I'm taken into Christ's life. And so, as a Christian, I'm incorporated into Christ's body. And what happened to Christ's body? was crucified, died, executed. The, the, the judgment on sin was placed on his body. But if I'm found in Christ's body, then I've died with Christ to sin. Jesus' body suffered the punishment for sin, and then it was resurrected to a new life. That's what happened to Jesus' body. And so for all of us who are in Jesus' body, that's true for us. So flick back to Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Because he's in Christ. What's true of Christ is true of him. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Mike Reeves, the sinner, is dead. Long live Jesus Christ. My old identity has been crucified. I live a new life now. That's what the Christian can say. Jesus Christ has now become my true and eternal identity. He is my identity. And so, I live now by faith in him as a new creation. Now, see what that does to self-esteem. You see, basing my self-esteem on anything in me anything I do or feel I am in and of myself simply makes a category mistake as a Christian. It forgets that 
in becoming a Christian, I've not just added a little something to my life, a little bit of spirituality. It's not like God has given me a little bit of grace, a little bit of spirit to soup me up. No. My old performance-based identity has been executed. It is dead. And that is great news. It is wonderful news. My performance-based identity has been killed. Why? Come with me, see one more uh, verse of Paul's in this. Come to Romans 6. You see how this is just so written throughout Paul's theology. Romans 6. And we see why we're crucified with Christ, where that takes us. Romans 6, verse 3. Paul says, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ were baptized, united with him, into his death? We were taken with him into death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Why, Paul? In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk now, even now, in newness of life and in the hope of our final bodily resurrection. Do you see, we're brought through death to a new life and a new identity. I am a new creation in Christ. Now this, my friends, is the Spirit's work. The Spirit's work is not primarily to help me to change in my behavior. Uh, Though he will do that. We'll, We'll come on to that in just a bit. The Spirit's first work is to change who we are. So the Spirit, uniting me to Christ, pulls me through death to the new life with Christ. Yeah? It's so radical. I'm pulled with Christ, pulled through that funnel, through death, to the new life of the resurrection. So, my question is then, if our old performance-based identity is executed, what then is the new life of the Christian? What is the new life of the resurrection that we have in Christ? I'm going to have to do it again. Who is it? Martin Luther. Martin Luther, when he first tried to explain his uh, gospel understanding at the Reformation to the wider world, he used a surprising verse. He used Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 16. Does anyone know what Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 16 is? Anyone know? Shout it out. It is, my beloved is mine and I am his. My beloved is mine and I am his. It's very similar to that great, I'm going to have to take this off. Sorry, I should have said Yavol or something like that. that, that. But Luther's seeing, it's very similar to that constant covenant phrase that the Lord says, I will be their God and they will be my people. It comes up in the Song of Songs, that great romance book in which you have the story of a lover and his beloved. And what Luther saw is the story of the lover and his beloved being united in marriage perfectly captures what it is to have the new life of the Christian. In that what happens is, united to Christ by the Spirit, this is a marriage union. And what happens in a marriage. What happens in a marriage? Well, she gets to say to him, all that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. That is what the believer says to Jesus Christ. That first moment she believes. And so she shares with Jesus Christ 
all her death, all her damnation, all her hell, and he takes it and dies on the cross. And he says to her, all that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. That's the great marriage swap on becoming a Christian. We take all that is Christ's. And so, just as the new bride takes the bridegroom's name and identity, so the Christian takes Christ's name and identity as their own. Let me read you something that an old hero of mine, Richard Sibbs, once said in wanting to comfort believers. He said this. He said, Often think with yourself, what am I? Oh, I'm a poor, sinful creature. But I have a righteousness in Christ that answers all. Oh, I'm weak in myself, but Christ is strong. And I'm strong in him. I'm foolish in myself, but I'm wise in him. And what I lack in myself, I have in him. He is mine. This, as a husband, is one with his wife. So we Christ's bride, the church, are one with Christ. And so, he is mine, says Sibs. His righteousness is mine. His righteousness is mine, which is the righteousness of God-man. And being clothed with this, I stand safe against conscience, hell, wrath, and whatsoever. And though I have daily experience of my sin, yet there is more righteousness in Christ who is mine and who is the chief of 10,000 than there is sin in me. Isn't that a great thing to say to yourself every day? There is more righteousness in Christ than there is sin in me. I read that to you from a book which you can get next door and I thoroughly recommend you to get it. The Love of Christ by Richard Sibbs. Anything by Richard Sibbs, just buy it. But I thoroughly recommend this. Basically, it's a few sermons that he wrote on the book of Song of Songs. And with Song of Songs, songs, uh, Richard Sibbs understood it to be where he said, this book is nothing else but a plain demonstration and setting forth of the love of Christ to his church and the love of the church to Christ. So he sees Song of Songs, it's all about the love between Christ and the church, told in a sort of bit like an allegory. Now, let's not get hung up on that. I I don't want to get into um, whether that's exactly right or not. I'm not particularly interested in getting into that. But Song of Songs, this great, the great romance song of the Bible, because it is talking about a marriage, we must say, at the very least, that we see something of the relationship between Christ and the church in that romance, because marriages, all human marriages, are... Well, what does Paul say in Ephesians 5? Do you remember? Paul says, and he quotes Genesis 2, and he says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What's the next bit? This is a profound mystery but I'm talking about Christ and the church. For human marriages are given to us to be a shadowing forth, a picture of the great and primal reality of the relationship between Christ, the loving bridegroom, and his bride, the church. So I don't particularly want to get into the details here, but I just want to pull a little bit out the sort of things that Sibs could see here in Song of Songs, of what the relationship, a good relationship between a bridegroom and a bride is like. Okay? What do we get to see? So I want to flick with you to Song of Songs. Come with me. And there's just some beautiful stuff to be seen here. Song of Songs, I think I want to dive in at chapter 4. And something I love about the Song of Songs is that you couldn't boil this down to mere statements, could you? It's beautiful poetry. And how appropriate, because it's talking about a romance, 
right? And that's capturing something that romance is a beautiful thing. Just so the relationship between Christ and the church should be sung of in songs, for it is beautiful. Not just true, but beautiful. And the thing you see in chapter 4 is just how much he loves her. So chapter 4. I'd I'd like to read all of it to you, really, but and we can't. See the strong words he used. Let's go from chapter 4, verse 7. He says to her, You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Wow. What a strong thing to say. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the den of lions, from the mountains of leopards, for you have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice? Do you see how much he loves her? He's not simply tolerating her. He delights in her, right? Now, that is theologically true of the relationship between Christ and his people. See, I think because Christ is so gracious, I think too often we can say, oh yeah, Christ saves, but it's like he just tolerates me. So he's pitied me, and he's been good to me in some sort of cold, you know, he flicks out goodness. There, you dirty thing. Have salvation. Ugh. <laughs> no! And if you want to see it, flick, uh, uh, no, don't flick to it. I'll just read, turn it to you. Um, Zephaniah 3, 17. Get this. The Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Wow, what a relationship. This is the new life of the Christian. Been brought into this union where he, the bridegroom, delights in us. Our old sinful identity killed. We're given a new identity. And he can declare, there is no flaw in you. He declares, we are righteous. We are beautiful to him. And he delights in us. Isn't that an attractive relationship? The the most enamored fiancé, just intoxicated, in love with his fiancée, is a picture of the great love that Jesus has for his people. In fact, the language used is outrageous in the Song of Songs. End of chapter 4. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb, um, my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends. Drink, drink, and be drunk with love. Wow! Wow! This, let's not dress this up all too much. It's, Christ is madly in love with his people. He delights in his people, has done everything to rescue them, and takes pleasure in his people. So much so that he comes to the garden of his beloved and enjoys tasting her fruits. When you are fruitful in the Christian life, as the Spirit moves you to love Christ, that delights him. He loves to see fruit in us. I think this is one of those moments where I want to say, know the truth and the truth will set you free.
Because at the heart of Christian growth is faith. In this instance, believing this, that we are no longer defined by our old selves, by the flesh that lingers. We are no longer defined by our sin, our failure, or by our own triumphs. We have a new identity, and it is in Christ. And that means there's no room for boasting in how spectacularly well I think I've done. I have a new identity. I can have a happy humility. Delighting to think more on him than I think on myself. Knowing how we are esteemed by him. Our sinful humanity has been esteemed and executed. And we are raised to a new life where he delights in us. Thus we can be content in him. That is our new selves. We have an identity that is not based here in how I'm doing and what I look like. Phew. We have an identity based in Christ, in our beautiful Savior, who is all perfect and all glorious, and he is our identity. Now, that is part one of what I want to say. But I've got a part two, if that's all right. What is looking to yourself? What is that in the Bible, looking to yourself? How does the Bible see that? Well, let's start right at the very beginning. We are created in the image of the God who is love. Now, to be created in the image of God means many things. But one thing it most definitely means is that created in the image of the God of love, we are created to be lovers, as this God loves. We are created to love God and to love each other. Right? Hence, when Jesus is summing up the law, he says, what are the two greatest commandments? What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That summarizes the law. That's what we're created to be about. So that's what we're created to be like, created as lovers to love God, to love each other. What went wrong? Because that's not quite true of us now, is it? What went wrong? Well, the interesting thing is, Adam and Eve never stopped loving. They didn't cease to become lovers. What happened in Genesis 3 they didn't cease to become lovers, cease to be lovers. It was that their love turned. That's what happened. The object of their love changed. And so when the Apostle Paul writes of sinners in 2 Timothy 3, he describes sinners as lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers we remain. But the love turned in sin, twisted, misdirected, created to love God, we turn in to love ourselves. That's love just going all wrong. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. But I want to take you to another interesting little um, chapter, Ezekiel 28, because Ezekiel 28 tells us something else about what's going on in Eden. It's just a little passing allusion 
But in Ezekiel 28, there's something very interesting happens. Now, Ezekiel 28, uh, this is Ezekiel's um, lament concerning the king of Tyre. And the Lord addresses the king, and he says this. Ezekiel 28 will go from verse 13. Now, do you see, you were in Eden. So this is, this is connected to Adam and Eve. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day you were created, they were prepared, you were anointed guardian cherub. Okay, that's deeply weird, isn't it? Yeah, I know you're thinking, <laughs> what possibly has that got to do with what we're looking at? I promise you there's a connection in my mad head. There's, there is a connection. And the connection comes with, well, for example, it's the guardian cherub. I want to point out, do you see your anointed guardian cherub? And this guardian cherub is wearing precious stones set in gold. Now, that surely is reminding us of Israel's high priest, who would wear, in his duties as high priest, a plate of gold on his chest, into which were set 12 gemstones, each one engraved with the name of one of the tribes of Israel, so the people of God on his heart. And he would serve before the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you know the Ark of the Covenant? The, um, I think Indiana Jones. Um, and it's not actually that badly done in Indiana Jones. Um, well, you know, there are bits there, but... Um, but just as you look at the Ark, if you can remember it, um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, that basically you have on the Ark of the Covenant, which would have gone in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, you have, it's this box with a lid, and on the either end of the box, a sort of rectangular box, you'd have these two golden cherubs. Um, we, aren't, we misunderstood what cherubs are today. Um, we think cherubs are winged babies. It's not two winged babies are on the... Because, do you, remember, do you remember where cherubs first come up in the Bible? Anyone remember? It's Genesis 3, where the Lord stations guardian cherubs with flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. So if that is a, a little baby with a flaming sword, <laughs> despite the flaming sword, Adam could just hoik the cherub out of the way and rush to the tree of life. So we know just from that, obviously a cherub, no, cherubs are fearsome beings um, in scripture. Uh, we won't go into that now. But the point of these cherubs were on the Ark of the Covenant was their eyes were fixed, sculpted to be fixed on the mercy seat where the Lord is said to be seated enthroned between the cherubim. This is like the Lord's throne, as it were. And so they are, as it were, their eyes are to be fixed on the Lord and where he'd be seated and where the sacrifice would be made. Now, come back to Ezekiel 28, because something goes wrong. A cherub is supposed to have his gaze fixed on the Lord and the mercy seat. But now verse 17. The guardian cherub, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. See, what's happened is a cherub should have gaze fixed on the Lord, but just as Adam and Eve turned in their desires and their loves away from the Lord to love themselves, so the gaze of the cherub turned from the Lord to his own beauty. He began to look at himself. And that's what went wrong in Eden, the garden of God. Love's longings, the desires of these hearts turned. So that where 
they were made to find the delight of their hearts in the Lord, who's the source of all delight. They turned from him to find their delight in themselves. And so in Eden, Adam and Eve, instead of naturally running to him, they now hide from him. I think this is rather well captured by John Milton, um, Puritan poet, the author of Paradise Lost. I don't know if you've ever read Paradise Lost. Um, Milton's a kook in many ways. Sorry, that's the way to damn someone in half a sentence. Um, He's quite wacky in some of his views, but just read like the first two pages of Paradise Lost, even on like Google Books or something. Oh, Oh, it's just beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful stuff. Mad and crazy later on in the book in many ways. But, but there's something he gets really well in Paradise Lost. As he's describing, basically it's a book about what went wrong in Eden. And he imagines, he sort of pads out the biblical story so that we just can uh, think more about it. And what he imagines is, before Adam and Eve actually take the forbidden fruit from the tree... Milton imagines Eve just wandering around Eden and she comes to this beautiful, clear lake. And as she comes to the side of this lake, it's absolutely clear. She comes to the side and she can see her reflection. This unfallen woman. She's so beautiful. And she takes a look, and this is how Milton reads. This is Eve's Eve's words. Eve says, as I bent down to look, just opposite, a shape within the watering gleam appeared, bending to look back on me. I started back. It started back. But pleased, I soon returned. Pleased, It returned with answering looks of sympathy and love. And there I had fixed mine eyes till now, and I pined with vain desire. Do you see what a clever thing Milton's doing? Is he saying, before she actually takes the forbidden fruit, the external act of disobedience, something's happening in her heart. She's beginning to look away from the Lord to desire herself, to have her eyes fixed on her own beauty. Now, that's not like the living God. God the Father has always for eternity looked outward to his Son, looked outward to his Son. And made in the image of this God, Eve was created to look outwards and so to look godlike, looking outwards, looking to God as the son looks to his father as a source of his delight. So Eve was made to look to him. But Eve was turning to look in to herself. And so she was turning from the image of God into the image of the devil in her self-obsession. Because the sinful turn from being lovers of God to lovers of self makes us more and more deeply devilishly ugly. Obsessed with ourselves, just as the devil is obsessed with himself. Martin Luther, oh, I'm not going to bother shoving it on again. Martin Luther said, sorry, Pete. Martin Luther said, the definition of the sinner is man curved in on himself. Isn't that a good definition? What is it to be a sinner? Just to be thinking about yourself the whole time, to be looking to yourself the whole time. Now, if that is actually the definition of what sin is, now how does the self-esteem thing look? Self-esteem, building your identity upon yourself, of course it's going to look dark. Of course it's going to yield 
black fruit. Because it's buying into that sinful move. Turning in on myself. Looking to myself to understand who I am. To appreciate my own beauty. But... What does the Lord do in coming to save us? Well, what's my first experience of the Lord's presence in my life? The Spirit comes and the Spirit opens my eyes so that I see who the Lord truly is. I see who the Lord is. The Spirit opens my eyes. I'd not understood what He was like before. And the Spirit opens my eyes and I say, oh my God, you are not as I thought you were. Abba. And as I see who he is, my eyes are opened and my heart is one. And so the Spirit starts luring me away from my self-love to giving me a taste for Christ. And I begin to see, amazingly, Christ is more interesting than I am. I couldn't believe that. That's what the Spirit did for me. That's what the Spirit does for me every day. I start saying, Seriously, Christ is actually more interesting than me. No! Yeah, oh, he is. He's actually more beautiful, more good, more worthy of my attention than I am. Now, that means a deep untwisting of me. A deep untwisting of me. Come back to the Song of Songs. Let's just see some more. Song of Songs, chapter 4, I showed you the bridegroom's desire for the bride. And we'll just very quickly see it. In chapter 5, you get to see her delight in him. She, by his love, finds she loves him. She finds, in chapter 5, verse 8, she's even sick with love. She desires him so strongly And she describes him from verse 10, this beautiful poetic description. It would be weird if it was a literal description, but you you capture the beauty of it. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs, and so on. And... That's what the Spirit does to the believer too. Just as a bride delights in her bridegroom, the Spirit opens my eyes so that I, as he desires me, I find I truly begin to desire him and more than anything else. And so, what the Spirit does is he untwists me. Naturally, I I just look at myself. I hellishly delight in myself. But the Spirit untwists me to be as I should be, to look to Christ as I was made to look. And so I find I begin, amazingly, to look like God. I look to Christ and take pleasure in Him as the Father has always done. And I find that knowing Him is life. Looking to Him is my refreshment and what enlivens. See the difference to self-esteem? Looking at myself. I want to read you something. A great bit of advice from a favorite old preacher from mine, of mine. Uh, his name was Charles Spurgeon. He was a 19th century preacher in London and he said this I think is the most wise pastoral advice he said this it is ever the Holy Spirit's work to turn our eyes 
away from self to Jesus. Satan's work is just the opposite of this. For Satan is constantly trying to make us regard or look at ourselves instead of Christ. But, says Spurgeon, we shall never find happiness that way. Of course. Of course sin can't ultimately provide happiness. We shall never find happiness, he says, by looking at our prayers, our doings, our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. If we would at once overcome Satan and have peace with God, it must be, says Spurgeon, by looking unto Jesus. That is the life of faith against the life of curved in on myself, self-obsessed sin. I look to Jesus. That's the Spirit's work in me. Think about it this way. What has God eternally been like For eternity, the Father has been content in his Son with nothing else. Nothing else. Content with his Son. He finds absolute satisfaction and joy in his Son. His Son is the place to find perfect satisfaction and joy looking to him. And so, you see, what the living God so kindly does to us self-obsessed sinners is he gives us his spirit who catches us up into that father-son relationship. So the father has eternally enjoyed his son and the spirit opens our eyes so that like the father we begin to enjoy the son. The father has always seen that his son is so delightful, he's perfectly satisfying. And the spirit opens our eyes so that increasingly we go, yeah, he really is that good. He is perfectly satisfying. And that is becoming godlike. I mentioned... The old theologian John Owen yesterday. John Owen said, Therein lies our, the principal part of our change into the image of God. Nothing makes us so like God as our love for Jesus Christ. See, that's what char- has characterized the Father for eternity. He's just loved his Son. And that's when we become truly Godlike. When we, like the Father, say, I love Jesus Christ. I'm content with him. He is satisfying to me. And I want to look not at myself, but him. That is the heartbeat of what it means to be godly. And that's why Jesus could say in John 8... If God were your father, Jesus said, you would love me. Because that's what the father's like. And those whose eyes have been opened by the spirit think on Jesus. And they want to think on him for they love him. They've seen how beautiful he is, how gracious, how kind. By the spirit, I begin to love aright. He unbends me. And so I begin to share the Father's pleasure in the Son. That is the life of faith. The Father has been eternally content with the Son. For this is where contentment is to be found, my friends. This is where contentment is to be found. In him. What are we seeing? 
we have a new identity in Christ. Our old identity has been killed. And we have a new identity desired and esteemed. Us esteemed in our new life by our Lord. And the life of faith is the life of being godlike. Looking to Jesus. That's it every day. Look to Jesus. Look out to him. For that is where you will find contentment. Not by looking to yourself. You'll never find happiness by looking to yourself. But in Jesus, there, as the Father has eternally known, there, ultimate joy and satisfaction is to be found. Don't look to yourself. Look to Jesus. That is the Spirit's work of liberation. Let me pray for us now. My Father, we are so self-obsessed and it hurts us. I pray by your Spirit, move in all of us so that every day, every day, we want to look to Jesus. We feel that temptation to look to ourselves, but we see that joy and contentment and satisfaction is to be found by looking out to him, that we find in him we have a new identity, and in him we have the desires of our hearts. And so may we find an ever-deepening liberation from our captivity to ourselves. And I pray for my brothers and my sisters here that they might find a deepening joy in the coming days and weeks as they look out to Jesus, the one who my Father has for eternity delighted you. In his great name we pray. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalisation. And Newton House, Oxford, invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.theola.gy